Welcome everybody to uh, today's LID seminar. It's wonderful to have Mary Wooters from Stanford um, giving a talk here. So she's a um, uh, assistant professor in uh, computer science and electrical engineering departments at Stanford. Um, she has a um, PhD in math from University of Michigan. She did a postdoc at CMU uh, before joining Stanford. Um, she works broadly in theoretical computer science and uh, related areas. Um, many of them at the interface of EE and CS, including error correcting codes, randomized algorithms, and related areas. She's won a bunch of awards, including NSF career and the Sloan Fellowship. And it's uh, really, really exciting to have her here to talk about sharp thresholds for uh, computation. Um, thanks, Dad, for the <laughs> cool. Yeah, so yeah, thanks for the introduction. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Um, yeah, so uh, like I said, hi, my name is Mary uh, from Stanford. Um, and I'm going to talk today about sharp thresholds for reliable computation from noisy gates. And this is joint work with Noah Shetty and Patrick Hayden, also both at Stanford. Um, and if you're interested to see the paper, you, you can find it here. And it's going to appear uh, later this week, I guess, at um, Fox, uh, the conference. Cool. OK, so what is this talk about? Um, so this talk is uh, about two questions, which are seemingly pretty unrelated. So the first one of these questions is, when is reliable computation possible when you have noisy logic gates? The second of these questions is, can we explain phenomena in quantum mechanics, in particular quantum non-locality, from intuitive axioms, like intuitive information theoretic axioms or something like this? Okay, so to the extent that you can even parse these questions in this level of generality, they, they probably seem pretty different, right? This, this question is, uh, you know, just about classical computation. This question is, you know, something quantum, quantum, something, something. Um, this question seems like a, you know, at least reasonably straightforward to state question in, you know, math or engineering or something like that. This question is maybe a little bit more philosophical. Um, but it, it turns out that there is actually a relationship between these two questions, um, at least for certain instantiations of, of this question here. And that relationship is uh, a big chunk of what I want to talk about during this talk today. Um, so the relationship between these two questions is not uh, new to our work. It's been around for a while, at least implicitly, uh, but we make it super explicit in our work. And um, I just think it's like a really cool connection. So uh, mostly I'm just excited to you know, tell you about it and, and share, share that with you. Um, so that's one of the things I'm going to do today. Uh, another thing I'm going to do today is tell you a little bit about some of our recent work in um, this space. Uh, so for this question, when is reliable computation possible when you have noisy logic gates? And talk a little bit about the implications of that for this question down here about foundations of quantum mechanics um, to going through this connection. Um, just a note, uh, I'm not going to assume any quantum mechanical background for this talk. Uh, I am not a physicist, so I'm not assuming that you know physics. And please don't assume that I know physics. And hopefully, we'll we'll all get we'll, we'll all get through it. Um, yeah, but uh, so this this is this is broadly what, what the talk is about. But I want to get started sort of on the classical side with these questions about reliable computation with noisy gates. So what exactly do I mean by that? Okay, so reliable computation. So here's a question for you. Um, probably you know the answer. Suppose that you have these gates. You have an AND gate, you have an XOR gate, and you have a NOT gate, or at least you have maybe like a bunch of copies of, of each of these gates. And the question is, given some function f, which takes in n bits and spits out one bit, can you build a formula using these gates to compute f? Right. Oh. OK, uh, let me actually just take a, a quick detour to define these words in, in case they're unfamiliar. So what do I mean by formulas over a given gate set? So a formula is just a function that can be made out of a tree of gates. So for example, this is a formula on the gate set and XOR and not. So I have a tree of gates that are you know, kind of connected by wires. And then the leaves of this tree are uh, inputs, which can either be variables or constants, like 0 or 1. Uh, and note that it's OK if the same variable shows up multiple times. That's cool. Right. So I have this tree of gates. I have some variables inputs that go in. I uh, run these inputs through these functions. And what comes out is some f of the inputs, in this case, f of x1, x2, x3. And if that's the case, I say that this formula here computes this function. Um, and just a note for this entire talk, I'm going to be talking about formulas, meaning uh, this diagram needs to look like a tree. Uh, in particular, it's not OK for like this XOR gate to have a wire that goes out somewhere else as well as this. So it should have fan out one. It should be a tree. Um, so that's the difference between formulas and more general circuits. For this talk, I'm focused on formulas. Um, 
Okay, so this is what a formula is. This is what it means to compute uh, a function with a formula. So back to this question, can you build a formula to compute any function you like using these gates? Okay, so you might know that the answer is yes, you can. Um, this gate set is universal. In fact, I don't even need the XOR, just an AND and a NOT is, is enough. So I can compute any function that I want using these gates. Great. Okay, now I'm going to make um, the question a little bit more complicated. Uh, now, not just reliable computation with some gates, but reliable computation with noisy gates. So I'm going to replace all of those nice blue uh, perfect gates that I had with um, these less nice yellow ones. So what have I done? I've turned all the gates yellow and I've added some subscripts. Um, and the subscripts here represent a failure probability. So these gates are going to be noisy and they are going to fail uh, independently with some probability. Um, and in this case, I'm going to say like all of my AND gates are going to fail with probability epsilon, all of my XOR gates are going to fail with probability tau, and all of my NOT gates are going to fail with probability kappa. Um, actually, for most of the talk, kappa is going to be zero. I'm going to give myself noise-free NOT gates, but just for this slide, let's, let's say that they're all noisy. Um, and uh, yeah, so what this means, for example, this XOR tau gate is it's got some inputs x and y, and what does it output? Well, with probability 1 minus tau, it does what it's supposed to, and it outputs x, x or y. But with probability tau, it does what it is not supposed to, and it outputs the negation of that. Okay. So now I have these gates that have some slight failure probability. And now I can ask the same question. Can I build a formula, C, using these noisy gates to reliably compute any function I want, f uh, that takes in n bits and spits out one bit? OK, so to answer this question, we need a few more definitions. It's not quite as clear how to answer, uh, like how to, how to set this up formally as it is for the noise-free case. But here, here's how I'm going to do it. Um, so once again, we can define formulas over a noisy gate set in exactly the same way that we define formulas over a regular gate set. So you have a tree of these noisy gates. You got some input variables. Um, but now the outputs of each of these gates are going to be a random variable over the randomness of this gate. Um, and I'm assuming that all of the gates have independent randomness for all of the talk. So the output then is going to be a random variable, uh, C of the inputs. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, and so in addition to um, this uh, sort of randomized way of drawing a function, I'm also going to allow probabilistic mixtures over formulas. So I'm going to say it makes sense to say with probability a third, uh, you know, use this formula. With probability two thirds, use this formula. That's a sensible thing to say. OK, so this is what I mean by a formula over a noisy gate set or a probabilistic mixture of formulas over noisy gate sets. What do I mean by reliable computation with formulas over noisy gate sets? OK, so let's say I have a bunch of noisy gates like these ones. Um, and let's consider some class of formulas. So for example, let's C be the class of formulas that I could make with these noisy gates. Uh, I'm going to use the notation conv of C to denote the convex hall of C. Uh, that is, like take like all the probabilistic mixtures that I can of all of the different things in C. Um, the, this will be useful for technical reasons later. Right, so we're going to be considering sort of the all, all convex combinations of formulas that I can make out of these noisy gates. And then I say that the convex hull of C supports reliable communication with some advantage delta. Here, think of delta as being like 0.1 or something, some constant greater than 0. Uh, if for any function f, um, you know, for any n, uh, there is some C, so some uh, probabilistic mixture of formulas using these noisy gates in the convex hull of C, so that for any uh, x, in 0, 1 to the n, so any inputs x, the probability that c of x is equal to f of x is uh, bounded above, bounded away from a half. So it should be larger than 1 half plus delta, where, where delta is my little advantage that I have here. Um, and I'm often going to just like ignore the delta and say that conv c supports reliable computation if there exists some constant delta so that this holds. So that's going to be my definition of supporting reliable computation. So basically, uh, there should be some way to use these gates or possibly with probabilistic mixtures so that I can, with some slight advantage, compute any binary function that I want, any Boolean function that I want. And, oh, yeah, hey, go ahead. Very hi. Um, uh, quick question. So the probabilities over the, the, the randomness comes from the gates and also the convex combination that you picked, right? Correct, that's right. So, so, so does this mean that I can use the same convex combination? In other words, like I pick a, um, you know, the circuits with a certain probability and then reuse them to compute for every X and I'll get the same advantage for all the X's somehow. Say again? So, so can I, uh, so there are two probabilities here, right? One, I yep. pick circuits with, uh, you know, different formula, formulas with uh, 
you know, it's a probability distribution of the formulas, right? Mm -hmm. So let's for a moment say I pick a formula at random from this probability distribution, right? Okay. Can I sort of reuse it for a bunch of x's and get the correct answer with advantage delta for each one of these x's? Does this make sense? Uh, um, you're saying would that satisfy the definition of reliable computation? Yeah, or rather, would this definition give me that guarantee? Uh, so somehow, you know, the, the way I parse the definition, uh, you first pick the random formula, right? Mm -hmm. And you use it for one X and then you will get this sort of advantage delta. What That's if right. I want to compute on another X, um, right? Would I have to pick another oh, formula? I see, uh, yeah, it might be another, uh, you're looking over the number. Yeah, I mean, so this, this probability here, as you point out, is over both of the probabilities in the convex combination and also in the uh, individual formula. Right, um, right. So it's the same randomness over the, the random, over the convex combination, it's the same randomness for every X, like for all X. Oh, oh I see, is that, it, that, that's the question is like, is the- I see. Okay, so, so, so the answer is yes, I suppose, right? Okay, I'm not, I'm not even sure I fully understood the question, but I'm, it sounds like it's resolved. So yeah. It, Okay. I think if I understand Guy, yeah, sure. I'm just guessing, so I'm not 100% okay. sure. But. So my question was, you know, can I pick a formula at random and then use it for all x's? You, oh. Um... Yes. Yes. The answer is yes. Okay, good, yeah. yeah. All right, thank you. Uh, yeah, um, yeah, uh, cool. <laughs> okay, yeah, so sorry about that. Um, but yeah, but hopefully the, the definition is clear. Um, yeah, and this looking at probabilistic mixtures of formulas um, doesn't matter. So it'll matter for technical reasons uh, later in the talk, um, but f you could also just think about like ignore that and just think about, you, it also makes sense to say that just this circuit class to begin with uh, supports reliable computation where just replace conv C with, with C um, for, for all of these. Um, yeah, and I should say, uh, yes, so thanks, uh, Vinod, for asking a question, and um, everyone, please feel free to interrupt um, at, at any time, because otherwise, uh, yeah, I'm just sitting here talking to myself in my office, and that's very sad. So please do interrupt um, and, and ask questions. Um, great. Okay, so this is the definition of reliable computation, and what I want to know is uh, when is reliable computation possible? That is, for what combinations of parameters, what combinations of noise parameters uh, can reliable computation be possible? And I, I should note for this talk, I, I don't actually care um, how big these formulas are going to get. Like they can get like really big. I don't care. Um, what I just care about is like w whether or not this definition is satisfied, whether this is possible at all. Um, so for example, we just saw that it was definitely possible when epsilon and tau and kappa were equal to zero, um, because then you could do this probability one. Um, you can probably see that when epsilon, tau, and kappa are equal to a half, um, this is not going to be possible um, because my gates are just outputting garbage. And so uh, you know, the probability that C of X is gonna be equal to F of X is just you know, a half at best. Um, so I, I can never uh, get something bounded away from a half. And my question is like, where in between there does this trade-off lie? And what I'm gonna be looking at for the rest of the talk is I'm gonna, I had three parameters, uh, tau, epsilon, and kappa on the previous slide, but for the rest of the talk, I'm gonna reduce this just to two parameters. So I have tau, which is the noise on my XOR gates and epsilon, which is the noise on my AND gates. I'm gonna allow myself, um, uh, noiseless NOT gates, um, so uh, AND gates or NAND gates, what, whatever. Um, but I have epsilon noise on the NAND gates or AND gates, tau noise on the XOR gates. And I just wanna know like in this space, like where, where is it possible to compute reliably and where is it not? Okay. So as you can imagine, this is a, a pretty classical question. It's been around for a really long time. Like von Neumann studied it in the fifties. Uh, and there's been a long, you know, really beautiful line of work um, trying to pin this down for various different circuit classes and formula classes. Um, so for the, for the question that I'm interested in, um, for, for this talk, you know, this little problem that I set up just with this particular gate set, or, you know, gates of fan in two, um, and formulas in general, um, the most relevant results uh, are due to Evans and Pippinger from 1998 and Unger in 2007. And they study the case when epsilon is equal to tau. So I have the same amount of noise on, on both types of gates. And what they show is, is something like this. So there's some threshold. Uh, which happens to be um, three minus root seven divided by four, uh, which is about 0 0.0885 right here, below which uh, reliable computation is possible. 
So if I have uh, gates with you know not too much noise, you know, this amount of noise, then I can reliably compute any function I want with non-negligible advantage. Uh, and on the other hand, here or above, like at this threshold or above, reliable computation is not possible. There's always going to be some function that I cannot compute reliably um, if my noise is so big. Uh, and it turns out that these results actually also imply that actually this whole region here is yes, um, because uh, the solution they use actually doesn't use XOR gates at all. So the noise on the XORs is irrelevant. Um, it's just sort of a threshold up to uh, on, on the AND gates. And um, you can, if you believe that adding more noise is not going to make it any easier, um, you can sort of extend this point here to say that uh, all of this is, is probably a no as well. All right, so reliable computation is possible here in the blue region, not here in the yellow region. Looking at this picture, you might think that well, maybe actually it doesn't even depend on tau at all, the noise on my XOR gates, maybe it only depends on the noise on the AND gates. Um, that turns out not to be the case. Um, there's a result of Broussard, Berman, Linded, Method, Taff, and Unger from 2006, which show that reliable computation is possible down here in this regime here. So here's, they're looking at noiseless XOR gates. So tau is equal to zero and noisy AND gates, uh, NAND gates um, with noise epsilon going up to a six. So uh, combined with this earlier stuff that I, that I mentioned, this, this says that if I were to, um, you know, back off from the noise on my XOR gates by a little bit going from here down to zero, then I'm allowed to put a little bit more noise on my AND gates and still achieve reliable computation. Um, cool. Okay, so those are uh, the results that are, that are known that sort of most relevant for, for our work. Um, the technical result that I'm gonna tell you about today is uh, an impossibility result. Um, and it basically says that this result of Broussard et al is tight. Um, so if you uh, are to look at the case where tau equals zero, so noiseless XOR gates um, and epsilon, that is the noise on the AND gates greater than or equal to a six, then you cannot have reliable computation anywhere in this region. And by extension, you know, adding noise on your XOR gates is not gonna help, so uh, up here as well. So this is the, the main technical result that I wanna talk about today. Okay, so, uh, right, that, that, that's part of what I'm gonna talk about. But the other thing I wanna talk about is why, why should we care about um, that question? Uh, which I think is a very, very valid question to ask. Well, so first, like at a high level, I think we, we should care about reliable computation with noisy gates. This is becoming more and more relevant as uh, you know, we're trying to make, um, you know, make circuits that are smaller and smaller and smaller, or we're using sort of new, uh, new tools and new technologies like quantum computation and so on. Noisy gates are a reality and you know, they continue to be and they are plausibly more so in the future. So it's, you know, it's important to understand questions like this. Um, however, that's a pretty unsatisfying answer to why should I care about this particular case where I have uh, noise-free XOR gates, noise-free NOT gates, and for some reason, epsilon noisy AND gates, right? I made my AND gate machine broke. That happens, I guess. Um, but so that, that's not actually the reason why uh, we were interested in this particular question. The reason that we are interested in this particular question comes from uh, motivation in the foundations of quantum mechanics, like I alluded to earlier. So what I want to do for the rest of the talk is first, I want to take a little detour into quantum mechanics or into sort of um, uh, non-local games and tell you about why, at least why I care about this case and, and maybe why you should too. And also tell you that, um, to tell you why our result, uh, just a, this result about circuit complexity, or sorry, this result about um, uh, reliable computation actually turns into a negative result in uh, the foundations of quantum mechanics. Um, once again, I'm not going to assume any quantum background. Um, so ho hopefully it should all be pretty user friendly. Um, okay, so I'm gonna tell you about that. Then after that, I'm gonna cycle back to the classical result and tell you a little bit about how the proof goes. Um, basically, we're going to modify a style of argument originally introduced by Pippinger in the 80s. Um, it's been used a lot to prove impossibility results in this space. The thing that makes it kind of challenging for us is actually proving impossibility results with noiseless XOR gates. Um, turns out to be uh, pretty tricky. Um, and we're going to exploit uh, a connection between something called amplification and reliable computation. Uh, and so this, this connection had been present before, but we, we like really make it explicit um, and we're going to exploit that. And then once we're done um, sort of with that proof overview, the third part of the talk, I'm gonna cycle back to quantum mechanics if time and tell you about a positive result to complement the negative result, which is kind of inspired by this connection between amplification and, and reliable computation. So that, that's the plan. Um, 
Okay, uh, any quick questions before I sort of go on to um, move on to this uh, quantum non-local game stuff? Cool, all right. And again, please uh, do interrupt me um, as, as often as necessary. Okay, so this first part, like why, why should I care about this and epsilon XOR not to zero uh, situation? And the, the motivation comes from explaining non-locality in quantum mechanics. So to motivate this, let me tell you about something called the CHSH game, um, which is a, a non-local game uh, studied in quantum mechanics. So CHSH are the initials of the, of the folks who came up with it. So this is sort of a classical game, sorry, quantum game, classical in the sense that it's been around for a while. Um, so here's, here's how it works. So Alice and Bob are playing this game uh, and they are each going to get inputs X and Y. So Alice gets a random bit, Bob gets a random bit independently. Uh, and importantly, Alice and Bob are, are separated by this dotted line, which means that they cannot communicate. And their goal is to output some bits. So Alice is gonna output A, Bob is going to output B. And what they would like is that the XOR of the bits that they output should be equal to the AND of the bits that they were given. So this is the game, um, fun game. Uh, it's made a bit difficult for Alice and Bob by the fact that they cannot communicate. Um, so it, it turns out that um, really there's, there's not a lot uh, very interesting that Alice and Bob can do here, at least if they live in a classical world, um, because they can't communicate. Basically the best thing they can do is to win with probability three fourths. This is probability over their random inputs. Um, uh, and the way that they do that is basically, you know, they could both output zero, for example, and then uh, their outputs are always going to XOR to zero and their inputs are going to be, um, the AND of their inputs is going to be zero with probability three fourths and, and they win. Um, and in fact, like they can't even do better if they share randomness. So if there's some, uh, you know, random coin up in the sky that's just like flipping random bits and you know, writing them in the sky for both Alice and Bob to read, they, they still can't do any better if they share randomness. Okay, so um, fun game, right? Uh, the thing about the, the cool thing about the CHSH game, the reason that people study it, is that perhaps surprisingly, if Alice and Bob share more than randomness, if they share quantum entanglement, then they can actually do better. So if they both have like part of some quantum state that is entangled, then it turns out via the magic of quantum mechanics that it is possible for them to win with probability one half plus one over root eight, which is approximately equal to 0 0.8536, which is notably larger than three fourths. Um, cool, right? Uh, quantum mechanics is crazy. Uh, so, all right, so I, I'm not gonna say anything about how they do this. It doesn't really matter for this talk. The, the point is that they can do this. Um, and this is an example of a non-local game. Um, which Alice and Bob can sort of do better quantumly than they can classically. So a, a question, if you haven't seen this before, or if you, even if you have seen this before, might be, why is this particular threshold, one half plus one over root eight, the, act, the correct quantum value, right? Like I, I can do some math that says that it is, um, you know, at least within the framework of quantum mechanics, it's been experimentally verified that, you know, at least you can do better than, than three fourths. Um, this seems to be the right answer, but this is somehow very unsatisfying. Um, it's certainly unsatisfying to me because like I said before, I'm not a physicist and I you know, don't understand, I don't pretend to understand quantum mechanics, but even to physicists who you know, understand quantum mechanics to the extent that anyone does, um, they, they also tell me that this is very unsatisfying. Um, and like in some sense, like this is unsatisfying since it's kind of saying like quantum mechanics is the way it is because uh, I don't know, that's what the formalism says. I read it in a book. Um, and you might hope for something a little more satisfying, which might be like, well, quantum mechanics is the way it is because uh, nature can't break the laws of information theory. You know, like maybe Alice and Bob can't uh, communicate faster than light or Alice and Bob uh, can't com compute any function they want with trivial communication complexity or something like that. Like that would be really nice if it were the case that a simple sort of natural axiom like that could explain why this funny number happens to be the quantum value of the CHSH game, for example. So there's been a lot of work um, sort of in the foundations of quantum mechanics trying to come up with sort of natural axioms, in particular information theoretic axioms, that can explain some or all of quantum mechanics. And this is very much like an, an ongoing um, you know, area, body of work. Um, and what I'm going to talk about today is, is one particular corner of it aimed at explaining this particular value, um, or in general, like the limits of non-locality when Alice and Bob are playing these sorts of non-local games. 
Um, so let me describe to you uh, some uh, one attempt that's been made um, by Van Dam and then also by this Broussard et al. work that I mentioned earlier. And basically that the idea is to try to explain quantum non-locality based on communication complexity. Right. So what is communication complexity? Uh, once again, we have Alice and Bob. Now they are allowed to communicate, importantly. Alice has some inputs x, Bob has some inputs y. Uh, so x is like a bit vector of length n and so is y. And they would like to compute some function f of x and y with probability, let's say, two thirds. Uh, now they are allowed to talk to each other. So how does this work? They're going to sort of send messages back and forth for a little while, and then Bob is supposed to output the right answer. And the goal is to minimize the amount of communication that they that they have to say. Like obviously, if Alice just sends her input to Bob, that works fine. That's correct. Bob can output the right answer, but that requires a lot of communication. And people tend to you try to figure out how little communication can you use for um, a given function f. So now uh, suppose that Alice and Bob could basically always solve this problem with constant communication. So in that case, uh, I would say that communication complexity is trivial. So communication complexity is trivial, means that no matter what function f, no matter how big n is, Alice can just send Bob one bit or a constant number of bits. And uh, Bob can say, can, can figure out the answer to the, uh, you know, can figure out f of x, y. This seems um, pretty absurd. This ought not happen in sort of any reasonable universe. Um, and so the, the idea of, of these folks is like, let's take it as an axiom that this does not happen. Uh, what sort of limits on quantum non-locality does this axiom place? So the hope is something like the following. Suppose that Alice and Bob could do better at the CHSH game or in general at some sort of non-local game than they could do quantumly. Right. So Alice and Bob have now, instead of sharing entanglement, they share some sort of super quantum flying pig type of entanglement beyond what the, what the real world actually has. And this somehow allows them to win the CHSH game with probability strictly greater than the quantum value. The hope is that uh, we can show how they can then um, use this ability to win the CHSH game to compute any function f of xy with only one bit of communication. Right. So if this is true, if they could somehow use these flying pig entanglement things, then they could use that to break communication complexity. And if we could show such an implication, then that would be a pretty good reason for why they could not do any better than this in the CHSH game. Because if they could, they would break communication complexity and communication complexity is not trivial. Okay, so that's the hope. Um, so uh, what I'm gonna do now for the next I don't know, five, five minutes or so is kind of walk you through um, the approach that um, uh, that's Broussard et al. work that I mentioned uh, took in, in order to try to show this. Um, so the first attempt uh, is let's try for Alice and Bob to break communication complexity, even just purely classically with just shared randomness. And what I'm going to show you is, is here's how Alice and Bob can do that with success probability a smidge bigger than a half. They're not going to be able to get all the way to two thirds or whatever I said in the definition of, of trivial communication complexity, but they can do one half plus one over two to the n. So here's how they do it. Um, they share randomness. So there's some giant coin in the sky that's just flipping random bits. And it's going to flip n random bits and call that r. And what Alice and Bob are going to do is they are just going to cross their fingers and hope that r happened to be equal to x, Alice's input. So what Alice is going to do is if r is equal to x, if they got lucky, she's going to send a single bit to Bob. That single bit is a equals 0. Otherwise, if they got unlucky, which happens most of the time, um, she's just going to send a uniformly random bit a to Bob. Now what Bob is going to do is he's going to compute f on r, hoping that it's equal to Alice's x and his own input y, and then xor it with the bit he got from Alice. So if they got lucky and r was equal to x, then Alice will send 0, and Bob will actually output f of x, y. All right. If they got unlucky, uh, then Bob will just be outputting uniformly random noise, and they'll be correct with probability a half. So this will give them success probably, probability just a smidge bigger than a half, you know, whenever they get lucky, that is that r is equal to x, they will win, otherwise even odds. All right, so one half plus one over two to the n uh, is their success probability here. Um, another way to draw this, which will be helpful in a moment, is that uh, Alice can basically generate some bit a, and Bob can generate some bit b, so that a x or b has a very, very slight bias towards the thing they want to compute, f of x, y. So I'm going to just Keep, keep this in mind because um, it'll come up again in, in just a second. Okay, so Alice and Bob can do this completely classically uh, without communicating at all. 
Right, so Alice can come up with this A, Bob can come up with this B. And basically what they're gonna to want to do is they're gonna to wanna to figure out how to amplify their success probability. Um, okay, so here's the idea of how they're going to do that. Um, and again, this is the uh, idea that, that was used in Broussard et al. Um, Alice and Bob can basically compute uh, on these like distributed bits uh, without even talking. So here, here's how it works. So suppose that Alice and Bob are playing some non-local game using their uh, entangled flying pig connection. And consider the following randomized gate, I'll call it the Alice Bob gate that I can build out of this, uh, this non-local game that they're playing, right? So the gate is going to have in it Alice and Bob and their flying pigs, and it's gonna take in as inputs Z1, Z2 up through ZT. And what's gonna to happen to the ith bit zi is I'm going to share it randomly between Alice and Bob. That is, I'm going to take zi and I'm gonna write it as xi, xor, yi, where xi is uniformly random. Um, and so the marginal of yi is also uniformly random, but of course they're, they're correlated because they are equal to zi when you sum them. Uh, and then I'm gonna send xi to Alice and yi to Bob. And I'm going to do this for all of the different bits. And now, Alice is gonna end up with some bits x1 up through xt, and Bob is gonna end up with some bits y1 through yt that sort of share the input bits um, z1 up through zt. Now, Alice and Bob are gonna play their non-local game. They're gonna do whatever strategy they have using their flying pigs, and Alice is gonna output A and Bob is gonna output B. And what this gate here does is it's just gonna take the xor of A and B and output that. So this gives me a way to turn a non-local game, or at least Alice and Bob's protocol for a non-local game into some gate, some noisy gate, um, assuming that whatever the flying pigs are doing might, might have some randomness in it. So now we can take all of these noisy gates that Alice and Bob can make during using their, their pigs and uh, connect them together. And we can sort of consider all of the computations, all of the formulas that Alice and Bob can build this way. So this gives us like a perfectly legit noisy gate set. It makes sense to talk about whether or not this noisy gate set supports reliable computation. So let's suppose for a moment that it does. In particular, it means that Alice and Bob can implement well any function they want. So in particular, they can implement majority. And now they're going, basically they're, the idea is they're gonna use this ability to implement majority to amplify that very tiny success probability that they had earlier. Right. So remember earlier what happened is they, there was a completely classical protocol for Alice and Bob to come up with an X and a Y so that X plus Y has a very slight bias towards F of X, Y. And here, here I'm sort of imagining that Alice is just gonna hold on to X and Bob is just gonna hold on to Y. So now the idea is I'm going to repeat this protocol a whole bunch of times, so T times. Um, so uh, I got X1 and Y1, X2 and Y2, all the way up to XT and YT. And I'm gonna take all of these inputs and shove them into this sort of majority circuit that Alice and Bob are able to compute because they can have uh, reliable computation um, with the gates that they can make out of their non-local games. So what do I mean here uh, by Alice and Bob can do this? So like here, Alice is gonna come up with this bit X1. And as I'm drawing it, it kind of like gets XORed with Y1 and sent in here. But like, just imagine that Alice takes her bit X1 and then just sends it straight up here to this X1. And Bob takes his Y1 and sends it straight over there to that Y1. So you can kind of imagine composing these gates like that. Uh, and at the end of the day, what's gonna happen is that this, this, this gate here is going to output A, X, X or B, which is going to be um, hopefully uh, equal or with high probability equal, decent probability equal to the majority of X1, O plus Y1, or sorry, uh, X1, X or Y1, X2, X or Y2 and so on. And remember that these things had a very, very slight probability bias towards being the answer that Alice and Bob wanted to compute. So then the majority of those things, the, the majority of the stuff with a bunch of slight bias then has a very big bias. So this, this output then is very likely to be equal to f of xy. Right. Um, so that means in particular, they can amplify their bias from one over two to the n uh, all the way up to some constant, some delta, which is our definition of reliable com uh, computation. Um, great. Uh, but then this means that communication complexity is trivial. And the reason is that, so if we go back to this gate here, instead of Alice and Bob each having their bits A and B and then just looking at the XOR and outputting it, um, I can now turn this into a communication scheme where Alice is just going to send her bit A to Bob and Bob is gonna output A plus B. And this is, this is exactly the same thing that the circuit was doing. So this is very likely to be equal to F of XY. Um, and uh, 
that means that communication complexity is trivial because now Alice and Bob have very likely computed f of x, y, and Alice only ever sent one bit to Bob, this a. OK, so um, the takeaway from this, um, I, I think this is such a nice idea. Again, this is the, the idea of um, Van Damme and, and uh, Broussard et al. Um, it's, it's really cool. Like, if these gates support reliable computation, um, then communication and complexity is trivial in Alice and Bob's world. So that, that should be the takeaway here. Um, so the, the hope is that we can then um, use this to kind of explain uh, you know, why Alice and Bob's world can't happen. So if, if they can support reliable computation, if they can solve the CHSH game too well, then they can support reliable computation, then communication complexity is trivial, but it's not. So therefore they can't beat the CSH, they can't play the CHSH game too well. Okay, so, but to do that, we need to understand what sorts of computations can Alice and Bob perform? So suppose they can play the CHSH game too well, uh, what, what are the Alice and Bob gates that they can generate? So first I claim that they can implement a noise-free XOR gate. Um, how do they do that? Uh, well, so here's, here's how they do it. it can, they can do it completely classically with no communication whatsoever. Um, you have Z1 and Z2 uh, are your two input bits that you wanna take the XOR of. You share them according to these XORs, then um, right, everything in sight is linear. So it's just fine, right? So Alice, and Alice just outputs X1, XOR, X2. Bob outputs y1, xor, y2. When these things get xored, it's the xor of all four of these bits, which is the same as the xor of x1, of z1 and z2. Right? So this gate is going to be a perfect xor gate, no communication necessary, nothing even quantum or fancy, just uh, pretty straightforward. And similarly, they can implement a noise-free not gate. Um, they have this z, which uh, then gets shared as x and y. Alice is just going to output x. Bob will negate his output and his input and output that. And then when I XOR everything together, I'm going to get the um, negation of Z. Cool. Okay, so Alice and Bob can implement noise-free XOR gates, noise-free NOT gates. Um, now I claim that if they can play the CHSH game decently well, then they will be able to implement a noisy AND gate. Um, so remember the, the CHSH game, um, the goal was for A, XOR, B. These are the the XOR of Alice and Bob's outputs should be equal to the AND of X and Y. So it seems pretty plausible that somehow being able to do well at the CHSH game should allow them to implement an AND gate. Um, so it's not quite as straightforward as saying like, look, it's literally just AND because there are you know, two inputs to an AND gate. Um, so Alice and Bob, Alice actually has two inputs and Bob actually has two inputs. But basically if they use the, the CHSH game twice instead of once, it turns out that they, they can indeed implement an AND gate. So if they can solve the CHSH game with probability one, they can implement a perfect AND gate. And if they can solve the CHSH game with probability you know, a little bit less than one, they can implement a noisy AND gate. So I'm not going to go through the details of, of how they do it. it. It's not too difficult, but um, the point is that, that they can. So this leads back to this question that I opened with, um, which is, when is reliable computation possible with this particular noisy gate set? So noisy AND gates, noiseless XOR gates, noiseless NOT gates. Um, and, and that's sort of why we came to ask this question, um, this particular question about uh, reliable uh, computation. Nope, sorry. This says communication, that, that should be computation. Okay, so what, what is known? So I told you a little bit about what was known for reliable computation. Um, before, what, what does that say about the CHSH game? Like, what is the punchline of this Broussard at all work? Um, There's a quick question from the yeah. chat. Uh, somebody asks, how do you do the initial sharing step without communication? I assume that's within the, the gate. Uh, yeah, so how do you do the initial sharing step without communication? So here, this is like the, the initial sharing step here comes from, from these things, I guess, right? And these are these protocols um, which are coming from this, this first attempt. Um, let's draw it this way. Um, where Alice and Bob have shared randomness, but they have no communication. So here there's, there's no communication going on whatsoever, but Alice is going to end up with A and Bob is going to end up with B uh, so that there's a very slight bias towards what they want and they haven't communicated. Does that answer the question? I think so. I don't know. Cool. Perfect. Yes. Awesome. Thanks. Uh, yeah, I can't see the chat box where to go um cool um okay yeah so uh guy i guess I'll, I'll rely on you to, to read the, the chat box thanks for, for doing that awesome. perfect yeah 
Um, cool. Okay. So yeah. Um, so that that's how they sort of originally share it, share it, and then you can just sort of propagate up. Great. Cool. Oh, actually, any more questions while while we're stopped? Awesome. All right. So um, what what is the punchline then? Uh, Okay, so I, I told you that they, they showed that reliable computation was possible, um, sort of up to noise on the AND gate one sixth. Um, and you know, there's some level of noise on a CHSH game, which will translate to one sixth noisy AND gates. What, what is that level? Um, it turns out it's 0 0.908. So if Alice and Bob can win the CHSH game with probability 0 0.908, then they can implement uh, an AND gate with error probability less than a sixth. Um, and in particular, that means that because of this result of Broussard et al, reliable computation is possible there, which because of the connection that I just sketched for you, that means trivial communication complexity, uh, it, communication complexity is, is trivial up here. Right. Um, so that, that's pretty cool. This kind of explains some limitations on non-locality just from this axiom that communication complexity is not trivial. Uh, unfortunately, it doesn't explain it all the way. Like we would really, it would really be very satisfying if this axiom could exactly explain the quantum value of the CHSH game, and, and it doesn't. It stops at this. This argument stops at zero point nine zero eight, rather than uh, 0.854, which is the quantum value. Right. So you might ask, okay, well, how, how much more would I have to extend this reliable computation uh, area in order to close this gap? Um, it turns out you'd have to extend it to a fourth. So you'd have to be able to show that reliable computation was possible with noiseless AND gates. Uh, sorry, noiseless XOR gates and noisy AND gates with noise um, up to a fourth. Um, okay, and that, that was the, the main open question of, that Broussard et all left is like, can, can you do that? Okay, so now getting back to uh, our result in this space, um, unfortunately the answer is no. All right, yeah, if, if we could do that, then, then we could extend uh, um, this, this trivial communication bond, right? But unfortunately the answer is no. So what we show is that there is no reliable communication or no reliable computation uh, in this region. Um, in particular, what that means is that if we're going to follow this strategy that was used by these earlier works of like amplify the excess, success probability by using the CHSH game as a noisy AND gate, um, we're not going to do any better uh, and, and this gap is going to remain. Um, so kind of a downer. Um, so I'm gonna, I mean, I'm going way slower than I thought it was going to go. So I'm going to tell you quickly about um, how we actually prove this result. And then if there's uh, a little bit of time left at the end, I'll wave my hands about how to turn this downer into uh, you know, actually a positive result um, by looking at our basically by looking at our proof that there is no reliable, re no reliable computation in this region. Um, we can come up with some sort of non-local game, not the CHSH game, but a different non-local game that actually is exactly pinned down by this axiom uh, uh, that communication complexity is true. Okay, but let me plow ahead um, into uh, this sort of real quick proof overview of, of why uh, there is no reliable computation with this gate set when epsilon is greater than or equal to a six. Right, so the, the main technical work is the following lemma. Um, and this lemma is, is similar to um, an approach that's used, uh, I guess, going back to Pippinger in the 80s, um, but uh, uh, for, for reasons that I'll, I'll mention in a moment, um, it's quite a bit more uh, involved for us. So suppose that C is the class of formulas on the gates, uh, the, the, this gate set here. So now um, I still have my noisy AND gates, but I've put noise back into the XOR gates. So the XOR gates now have some noise tau uh, which is something between zero and one, but like strictly positive. Right. Um, and I still have noiseless knock gates. And suppose I have some function f that can be computed with some slight advantage uh, from functions in conf c. Um, then the conclusion is that f depends on a constant number of inputs. So for example, if f looks something like this, right, so it's just some function using these gates, uh, then for all but a constant number of inputs, like they, those, those other inputs basically cannot matter for, for the output of, of f. That's what this lemma is saying. Okay, so why is this lemma true? Uh, let me just sketch the proof idea real quick. Um, so this is super, super high level proof idea. Um, so we first prove a sort of a sub lemma, which says that in any probabilistic mixture of formulas with k inputs, there is some variable that is pretty deep in terms of k. 
So what does that mean? So suppose I have some formula that looks like this. And it has k inputs. In this case, uh, it has three inputs, x, y, four inputs, x, y, z, and w. Um, some of these inputs are shallower and some are deeper. So like x is pretty shallow, shallow and y is pretty shallow. They appear pretty close to the output. But uh, there's one variable, uh, z, which appears pretty deep. Um, it has a long path to travel. You know, every instance of z has a long path to travel to get up to the output. Um, and basically, just an averaging argument shows that this is always going to be the case. If you have many variables, one of them has to occur pretty deep. Okay. Um, so then what we show is that uh, an appropriate notion of bias, uh, aka signal, is going to decrease by a constant factor at each gate. Right? So each gate has a little bit of noise on it. Um, remember, I've put noise back on the XOR gates here. Uh, and so if Z is, is pretty deep in this tree, then you know, every time Z passes through some gate, uh, the uh, amount of signal that I get you know, on this wire is going to decrease because I'm going to inject some noise each time. Um, and so basically using this idea, you can show that uh, as k, the number of variables that this formula depends on grows, reliable, <clears throat> excuse me, reliable computation um, is going to become impossible because there's at least one variable upon which the function depends, where basically all the signal from that variable is going to be dampened out by the time you get to the top. Um, so that's a super high level idea. The actual details are much more complicated. And this is where this threshold one six comes in. One six turns out to be just the threshold at which this um, uh, sort of this dampening uh, starts taking hold. OK, but as a corollary of that, um, we can say that this gate set with a little bit of noise on the tau's, uh, on, on the XORs does not support reliable computation. Right. Indeed, there are functions which depend on more than a constant number of inputs. And I just told you that this gate set cannot compute them. Okay. So this does not uh, support reliable computation. So this is almost what we want, right? This has tau very small. For our application, where Alice and Bob have perfect XOR gates, um, we would like to take tau equal to 0. So just send tau equal to 0, cross our fingers, and hope it works. Uh, almost. So that doesn't, you can't actually like redo the proof that I just sketched for you with tau equals 0, because actually this lemma is extremely false for tau equals 0. Um, so for example, just think of the parity function. Uh, the XOR of all of the bits. This depends on every single bit. Uh, this depends on every single input. And if I have noiseless XOR gates, I can compute it perfectly. All right. So uh, this, this lemma is like false when tau equals zero. So I'm, I'm not going to hope to make this analysis go through when tau equals zero. But instead, what we're going to do is we're going to show that the set of parameters, epsilon and tau, that do not support reliable computation is closed. It's a closed set. Um, and in particular, that means that I am allowed to send tau equal to zero uh, you know, after the fact and conclude that reliable computation is impossible for tau equals zero and epsilon in the closed interval 1, 6 to 5, 6, which is what I wanted to show. Um, OK, so the, the thing that remains to be shown is like, why, why is this set closed? Uh, and, and we show it in, in maybe kind of a roundabout way via a connection to something called amplification. Um, so we say that a function f is an amplifier if it looks like this. So it, it should take in a bunch of slightly biased random bits, iid random bits. So let's say that I have bias like 1 half plus epsilon. And it's going to output one random bit, which has bias a little bit more than that, 1 half plus 2 epsilon, or you know, something like that. Um, and if, if a function does that, I call it an amplifier. It sort of amplifies the bias. Um, so for example, the majority function is an amplifier. Um, if I have a little bit of bias towards one, the output is much more likely to be one. Um, it's a more general definition of an amplifier. Uh, basically, an amplifier is any function um, where if I look on the x-axis at the bias of the bits in and on the y-axis at the bias of the bits out, and I plot this curve, there should be some fixed point here at p naught where the derivative of this curve is strictly greater than one. Because um, that means that if I go a little bit above p naught in terms of my input bias, then I'll go more than that above p naught in terms of my output bias, and the same thing on the other side. Right? So uh, more generally, an amplifier is anything um, whose sort of amplification function looks like this. OK, uh, why, why, why am I telling you this? Um, well, it turns out that amplification is very related to reliable computation. Um, so this is a connection that has been exploited before in lots of works, um, but we, we make it super formal. Um, so we actually prove a theorem that says that amplification is equivalent to reliable computation. Um, so this should be pretty plausible. Like this argument that I sketched before, um, basically what was happening is they, this Broussard et al. argument uh, 
used a majority function um, as an amplifier to amplify the success probability of all of these little uh, uh, classical, classical trials. Um, but uh, previously, this connection was either implicit or, or rather specific. Um, we show a very general theorem, which is that if the convex hull of C contains both an amplifier um, in that more general sense that I described earlier, and also a noisy not gate, then it supports reliable computation. Uh, and the converse is obviously true. If it supports reliable computation, then it does contain an amplifier and a noisy not gate. Um, so this is a complete characterization of uh, reliable computation in terms of amplification. Um, so basically, if you want reliable computation, the only thing you could do is um, just try to amplify up your success probability. Um, the basic proof idea, real quick, is we're going to use the amplifier and a NOT gate to simulate a pretty reliable NAND gate and then build a circuit out of NAND gates. Um, since NAND gates are universal, maybe we can do that. Um, one just note, one reason why this perhaps hasn't been stated uh, so explicitly before is that our proof crucially uses the ability to take probabilistic mixtures of formulas, this convex hull thing that I was mentioning earlier. Um, and I, I'm not sure if the statement would be true without that. Um, and previous work hadn't, hadn't considered that. Um, we, we were allowed to consider that because Alice and Bob are allowed to take convex mixtures in the uh, quantum application. Um, cool. Okay, but wh why was I talking about that? Um, returning to this claim, I wanted to tell you that the set of parameters, epsilon and tau, that do not support reliable computation, that that set is closed. And then that would allow me to send tau equal to zero. So how do I do that? All right, here's a proof via amplification or via this connection to amplification. So suppose that the convex hull of C supports reliable computation. Then um, I just told you it contains an amplifier. So something that looks like this. Now, suppose I fiddle with epsilon and tau a little bit. I claim that's not going to break the amplifier because amplification is kind of a continuous thing, right? Like if I fiddle with uh, epsilon and tau a little bit, that's gonna fiddle, you know, maybe the location of this fixed point, it's gonna fiddle with the slope a little bit, but if the slope was strictly bigger than one, then you know, if I fiddle just a little bit, it's still gonna be strictly greater than one. Right? Um, so therefore, after I fiddle with epsilon and tau by a little bit, if I get some uh, set C prime after that, the convex hull of C prime still supports reliable computation because it still has an amplifier. So therefore, the set of parameters so that, that do support reliable computation is open, so the complement is closed. Done. Right. So that means that uh, this lemma is true, and now I'm allowed uh, to sort of legitimately send tau to zero without breaking anything, and, and I can conclude this, this main theorem. OK, so I'm, I'm basically out of time. Um, I had uh, sort of uh, just a, a little bit to say about getting back to non-local games. So let me um, basically jump to the punchline. Um, so the basic idea is that there is a family of games, g sub t, um, that we can define. And, and basically, this game, we call it the amplification game. So the game is that Alice and Bob are trying to implement an amplifier, because we just showed that amplification was equivalent to reliable computation. And we said that reliable computation basically meant trivial communication complexity. So there is a family of non-local games for Alice and Bob to play, so that the picture looks like this. Um, there's some classical value for these games. There's some quantum value, which is some weirdo thing. And if you step a little bit beyond that quantum value, all of a sudden, communication complexity becomes trivial. So in some sense, for these games, the axiom communication complexity is not trivial does uh, kind of explain the quantum value of these games. Um, or so that there, there are some aspects of non-local games that this axiom can uh, can explain. Wait, what, um, is, what are these? What are these games? Uh, yeah. Okay. So, all right. So if I go over, it's it's uh, it's your fault. Um, like it's I said, it's, it's yeah, basically. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah so it, it, like I said, it's, we call it the amplification game because it's basically um, amplification, right? So the the goal is that so Alice and Bob are each getting an input string that's random according to some distribution, and they output bits A and B. And their goal is just to have the XOR of A and B be equal to the majority of the XORs of X and Y. I see. Right. Um, and, and the point here is that you know, if Alice and Bob could do better than the quantum value, whatever that is, then they could implement an amplifier. Uh, because basically, this game is exactly, can you implement an amplifier game? And if they can implement an amplifier, they can implement reliable computation. And then uh, we said earlier that if they could implement reliable computation, their world would have trivial co uh, communication complexity. Um, so this connection to value is easy, easy to understand. Uh, it is, yeah. Um, so, right. So there's one one hiccup here. So the quantum value for this game 
Um, so it's, it's of the form one half plus something that depends on t, where t is the, um, the number of input bits here for Alice and Bob. Um, the, the catch here, this actually is not the final game. Um, this is a little bit unsatisfying um, because it turns out that the quantum value is extremely easy to understand um, because it's exactly the same as the classical value. So the best strategy here is actually classical. Um, but what we can do is, uh, yeah, so this is not quite satisfying because like our explanation doesn't really pin down the quantum value. It just sort of you know, pins down the classical value. Um, but what we can do is take a slight modification to get this and, and basically, um, you take some other game where quantumly Alice and Bob can win with probability one and classically they cannot. Uh, and then you kind of mix the two games together uh, appropriately and you can like sort of spread, spread apart the, the classical value and the quantum value. Um, and in this case, the quantum value here is something, something kind of funky. The classical value is also something kind of funky, um, but uh, communication complexity like exactly pins down this kind of funky quantum value. Cool. Um, does that answer the question? Yeah, yeah, that's awesome, yeah. Um, yeah, but the, ba the basic idea is that even though we got this like negative results, um, you know, that we couldn't really push. So we started out working on this, trying to figure out how to push the result of Broussard at all further. We really wanted the positive result there. And then we you know, ended up with a negative result and we were very sad. Um, but uh, yeah, but so somehow along the way, like this connection to amplification sort of tells you exactly what is the right set of games to look at if you want a positive result in that line. The, along those things, along uh, that line of reasoning, and it's um, basically amplification. Um, and moreover, because of this tight con connection between amplification and reliable computation, um, you, these games are in some sense fundamental for this, in the sense that in any world with trivial communication complexity, um, Alice and Bob can uh, beat the quantum value uh, of this game. So not just if they can beat the quantum value, then communication complexity is trivial, but some sort of converse also holds. Okay, all right, so I guess I'm, I'm two minutes over. That's okay, um, thanks for everyone waiting. Um, let me just wrap up real quick. Um, yeah, so quick summary. Uh, I started out by uh, you know, asking you this question about classical reliable computation with noisy gates. Um, and you know, I, I think that thinking about classical, like I, I think this question is interesting on its own, um, just interesting from a perspective of fault-tolerant computation. Um, but the reason that we cared about this particular question with this particular distribution of noise um, came from this motivation from non-local games. Uh, and then uh, unfortunately there was a negative result there, um, which we proved using this connection to amplifiers. Uh, but fortunately the connection to amplifiers then allowed us to state some kind of positive result, which is that um, by setting up sort of an amplification game, um, at least we can use this axiom communication complexity is non-trivial um, to uh, pin down the quantum value of uh, something or you know, some, some large class of games. Okay, um, so, uh, oh yeah, let me say some open questions. So on the noisy computation side, um, like I, I think I, I had this uh, diagram earlier. So this is like what's possible and what's impossible with epsilon and tau. Um, and there, there's still a big gap here that we don't know. So that's, I think a really interesting open question. Like there's gonna be some, some way to connect this point to that point, like some curve or some line or something. I have no idea what it is. Um, I think that's, that's a really interesting question. Um, also, everything that I was talking about today was for formulas. Uh, it'd be really interesting to get um, sort of a lower bound for circuits, more general circuits, where my gates are allowed to have fan out, non-trivial fan out as well. Um, as well, uh, that would be cool. And of course, like I guess from the quantum perspective, the big question is like, is there some other way to explain the quantum value of the CHSH game? Like, it's, it still could be possible that you could do it from the axiom communication complexity is non-trivial. We just showed that like this particular approach wasn't going to work, but like maybe there's some other approach. Um, or maybe there's some other natural axiom which would do it. Uh, those are really interesting questions. Cool. Okay, um, yeah, and also just a quick advertisement. Um, for something completely different, uh, I'm going to be giving a talk on Friday in the Stochastics and Statistics Seminar. Um, so if you want to hear about combinatorial properties of random subspaces and some new results about LDPC codes, um, come, come to that talk. Um, that's going to be, yeah, completely different, um, but might also be fun. Okay, so with that, I will uh, only four minutes late. Thank you for your patience. Stop talking, and I'll take any more questions that, that you have. Thanks. That was terrific. Yeah, thanks, Mary. So, yeah, if people have questions, feel free to ask them. Um, I know that there are, by the way, many people who will be watching the recording, so they'll be uh, excited to, to see that. Okay, here's a question also from Mishrant. Uh, are there is there a reason or motivation to study correlated logic gates? 
I see. So in this case, we're studying gates where the failures are all independent. And then you're asking like, what would happen if like this failure is correlated with that failure? Um, is, I assume that's the question. Um, yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so I think there are good reasons for it. I'm not sure about the coming from the quantum situation, but but coming from like physical computation, sure. Like if something bad happens to this part of the chip, then it's likely to affect this gate and also the ones nearby. Um, in which case, uh, you know, maybe that's reasonably modeled as uh, failures being correlated. Um, so I, I think it is motivated. Uh, I, I don't know of any results in, in that space though. Uh, so it's a really good question. One more question, if I may. Um, so um, so you, you, you sort of interpreted communication complexity being trivial as saying that, you know, with one bit of communication, you can compute all functions, right? Yeah, uh, or, but, or con constant number of bits, I guess. Yeah. Oh, constant number of bits is okay too. Because, you know, if you have, if you can win CHSH with probably more than 0.9, you can really compute with one bit, right? Uh, uh, right, right, yeah. Uh, but maybe if you extend it to like constant or like log n or maybe even like n to the 0.99 bits, uh, perhaps a smaller CHSH probability is good enough to, uh, you know, if you relax the notion of non trivial mm -hmm. communication complexity. Perhaps you can do better, you know, you can reach the CHSH probability like 0.85 or whatever. Maybe, yeah, so I guess, um, so I, I said um, one bit, but I, yeah, I meant constant bits. Um, and the, the reason there is, uh, you yeah, know, so as long as I can implement, you know, as long as I can win this game with some probability a half plus some constant, then if I, have, if I get constant bits of communication for Alice and Bob, then I can amplify that up to 0.99999. I, they can just repeat it and send as many, send some, some constant number of bits. Um, mm -hmm. So that means that, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, like any constant. Um, so, so the so 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 the conjecture is that if extending the constant to like even n to the point nine nine may not help. Um, yeah. Wait. So, what, what would that mean? You're saying like if I could win the CHSH game with probability n to the point nine nine. Uh, no, so, so then, I, I would like to say that if you can win the CHSH with probability slightly less than 0.9, let's say, right, which is yeah. not covered by Prasad, um, uh, maybe I can compute all functions with communication complexity and to the 0.99. Oh, oh, I see. Um, you know, uh, which I can't, okay. without, which I can't in the classical world, like in a product takes n bits of communication. So, you know. Right. Uh, yeah, yeah, that would still be. Yeah, so I guess like if I could win, yeah, so the, I guess getting rid of the quantum stuff and going back to just right. gates right. that that means like okay so suppose I can win um, uh, I have I have an AND gate which is just a little bit noisier than one six uh, there, right. is right. it possible to do reliable computation like I can't do it with probability one half plus any constant but can I do it with probability one half plus something slightly subconstant that's the question yeah uh, that would that would do it. That, that would basically do it. Yeah, that's the same thing. Another way to do it is uh, is change the notion of reliable computation. So so you know it's not like I have to output like one bit each, who's, which exhausts to the the answer, but maybe I can output many bits, which somehow represents the answer. Like you know you can post compute on these like uh, I don't know into the point and and somehow. I see. Like, uh, of course, the issue with this is that this may not compose and. Right, this connects to communication complexity because if I could do reliable computation with this notion, I'll just send you this n to the point nine nine bits at the end, and that's it, right? Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, that is a good question. Um, yeah, I have not thought about that. Uh, Fair enough. I, I don't know. Right, I, I get there. There must be some amount of like failure probability at which it becomes okay. You know, if, if, if I want to win with probability. Right. Uh, yeah. Um, like right. I said, if I want to win with probability one, one half plus one over two to the end, then like I could definitely do that. Uh, yeah, and I guess at the point that it would still become a reasonable axiom. Um, hmm. yeah, yeah, it's a good question. I'm sorry, I don't have a good answer. Uh, thanks. Yeah. Thanks for the talk. Cool, thanks, Mary. Um, Any other questions? Seems, seems like that's it. I guess we're, we're a bit over, over the hour. Yeah, over so, time. Uh, so yeah, thanks everyone for, for sticking around. <laughs>
And again, everybody, you can see Mary's second talk on Friday at 11. Um, have a good rest of the day. Thanks for, thanks for watching. Thanks for having you. See ya.